my background, I've been practicing for a couple decades, let's say, and um, I spent a lot of time working in public accounting firms and had a lot of great clients in a lot of different industries doing a lot of different things. And then a couple of years ago, I had an opportunity to leave and go to work with a client as their CFO, and I've, now I've had a chance to work with a couple of really great early stage companies right here in um, Allegan, Holland area. And, um, and I still, because I'm a surge member, I also get to work with surge members occasionally. If they have an accounting question that comes up or, or a finance question or maybe a little project that they wanna do. Um, so I've had a great opportunity to work with a lot of different folks and a lot, doing a lot of different things. And, and I really, really love it. So, and I know not everybody does love accounting, but it's just kind of, it's the nature of the beast. It's like, I think I even said it here somewhere, it's probably the biggest job you never signed up for and never really realized you're gonna have to do. <laughs> and so in putting together our materials today, um, it's, it might be very broad based intentionally to be able to expand what we wanna talk about it and we, I'm just going to go ahead and say we have enough time if questions come to mind even as we're going through the slides let's address questions as they come up and if it's something maybe we need to set aside and talk about more later than we can but um, I don't let's just ha let the conversation flow and take it from there so uh, a little bit about myself, we just talked about that. I, uh, my husband and I do have several children. We are super excited. We've got five grandchildren. We, that's where we spend most of our time playing with our grandbabies and our dogs. Um, one of my kids talked me into re-becoming a clumpin' dancer. So you got to dance during tulip time. And I don't regret it yet, but I don't know if I'm gonna do it yet this year. <laughs> So um, here are a couple of the general topics that I wanted to address, and again, I wanted to emphasize if something comes to mind, um, something that we talk about or someone else says, first question for you, then let's talk about that too. We'll make this a very collaborative, um, informal kind of conversation. Um, and there are a couple, actually a couple of great articles that Amanda uh, keyed me on to. Um, We'll, we can probably get you guys all these slides, Amanda and, and Christine can chew them out to you um, when we're done. And um, so I was going to start talking about the difference between accounting and bookkeeping, but actually I'm going to start with bookkeeping, I think. Bookkeeping is that process that we all have to go through of keeping a record of your business activities. You know, you, most of the time, when we, especially when we're first starting, we have to pay for things. So we're keeping track of, um, we're opening a checkbook that's specifically just for the business. You know, you know, may I stop for a moment and take a step back and, and ask you guys, how many of you are at a brand new company that you've just started? So very, very early, yes. And how many it's uh, five years or less? Five years or less, yeah and so the rest of you are a little bit longer than five years. So we're all still pretty early. And, um, and you know, it's just the nature of everyone's businesses that they accelerate at different paces and your, the volume of activity is a little bit different. So I'm keeping that in mind as we talk, again, and ask questions as they come up. So with respect to bookkeeping, this is the very first thing that we all start to do is open our, our uh, checking account and start to keep track of what's business activity. And you really think about what's the difference between something that I'm doing for my business versus something that's flowing through my personal checking account. And that's like the first major step for folks to take is I might have paid for a couple of things out of my personal account, but now I really have to get, get official and open that checking account. And so we're keeping track of um, things that we pay for, people that we pay who have helped us, um, uh, invoicing when we've sold a service or we've sold a product to someone else, we're going to invoice them, we're going to keep track of that sale and keep track of the, the cash payment that came in with that. And 
this is the part that honestly starts to throw people off really fast. What do I need to keep? How do I need to record it? Is there a certain way specifically that I need to record it? And so one thing that I have found in working with companies from pre-startup through, you know, having been in business for decades is it, in the very beginning especially, it evolves. And if, as, long as, you're keep, as long as you're keeping, retaining the records of, of what you've spent, your paper records especially, even in this day of electronics, then you'll be able to find someone to help you. Where I found people kind of become overwhelmed is as that, the, that pace of volume starts to change and you've got two more transactions and that's all good. And if you don't have a process to take care of it, then it can start to feel very overwhelming. Um, the bookkeeping itself is the basis for accounting, which I'll go backwards. Account accounting contrasted with bookkeeping is, well, after all your records are in your accounting system, then you wanna pull them back out in an organized fashion so they tell you something. Do you have a, actually I scroll way, 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 way up to the, to the begin to the front here. This is an example of when your when your bookkeeping starts comes back out and you can run a report for yourself or have someone prepare a report for you that tells you so what actually happened. Here's what our sales are. Here are all the various items that we spent money on. We paid our people, we needed to pay for our space, we needed to keep the lights on. Some naughty person did not pay us. Um, we're going to write off our equipment over time and then all of your bookkeeping can be reported in an orderly fashion where the intent is to be able to make business decisions in a timely fashion by understanding what's happening with your finances. Keeping good records. Well, as I mentioned, this may be the biggest job that you never signed up for. Keeping, maybe we can even go forward to what do you need to keep? Record keeping includes things like your bank statements, bank reconciliations. Um, hopefully everyone is completing a bank, a formal process of reconciling your bank statement every month. You'd be surprised by folks that don't do it and maybe they don't know how to do it, are so busy building the business that they don't necessarily take the time to do it. But reconciling your bank statement um, is something that, first of all, you should do the, uh, complete the process and then go ahead and also hold on to that bank statement, hold on to the reconciliation. Credit card receipts is another item that I struggle with getting credit card receipts from folks at every single business that I'm working with, it is kind of a pain. And when you're out, um, maybe you uh, just buying supplies for the office, or maybe you wanna take someone out for lunch because they're a prospective new customer. Hang on to that credit card receipt, just write a quick note on what it's for, throw it in a box, that's A-okay. So I used to do that, but I thought if it's under a certain amount, now we don't need that. That's Bank true. statements are fine, and why do all the hassle? If I'm, you know, being a good girl, go well, I don't do it. My husband's <laughs> being a good boy, go it, reconciling it at the end of every month. Do I actually need to do that? That's an excellent question because that um, is another topic that it, it is in the materials here is with respect to filing for tax, tax your tax return. The responsibility of documenting all of your expenses really is on you. It's not the responsibility of the IRS to say, um, we're gonna prove that you are wrong, you have to prove that you're right. And so having receipts for all of these items that you spend is obviously a piece of evidence that you'd wanna hang on to. But there also is, and Liz, I don't remember the threshold, mm -hmm. is under, a hundred, yeah. But we can find this up. So there's a threshold under which the IRS actually says you you don't have to you don't have to keep a, re a receipt for every single tiny little charge that you have. So there's a little respite from keeping track of everything. Now, a mileage record is also something that is one of the most common things people don't necessarily keep track of. You know, you, again, maybe you drive to lunch to meet with someone. 
prospective client or something and then you get back and you're like, oh dang, I forgot to write down my mileage. Uh, again, that would, that would have been me. I'd never remember to write down my mileage. But to these days, and this is kind of a plug for, for Temple, if you have a wonderful planner or keep your calendar as one should, you have a record of who you've met with and where you were. And then of course, we've got tools that are, make it very easy to type in the, address, so the addresses. And then you can hang on to print or PDF that page to keep track of mileage and, and I'll often go back in time and you know because I admit that I'm not always on top of it 100% of the time and then go back and keep that and there are several reasons that it's important to keep your mileage record and for for example um, uh, a snowplow business there are of course many many of those around here they've got their whole um, inventory of trucks well what if a couple of the guys, actually, or guys or gals, will um, drive the truck home, you know? And so there's like a personal aspect of it. The IRS actually wants to know what portion of use of that vehicle is personal use versus business use. And keeping track of your mileage is something that they, they will expect um, as, as part of the records. Mm -hmm. um, well, what if you have a a company vehicle, like a Sprinter van? Mm -hmm. like, Excellent. Can you just write it off 100%? If it's 100% business, yes. And I'm sure you know some. There are also always things that happen where you might someone might, depending on what it is, might buzz off somewhere. But yes, a vehicle that's used exclusively for business is 100% deductible for your taxes. Yes. Contracts of any kind. This probably seems intuitively obvious that if you have some kind of a business contract, you're going to hang on to that. And I, I did toss in a catch, catch all of everything else that it's always better, especially if you want, it's always better just hang on to everything. It might, regardless, yes. How long do you hang on to? That's a great question yeah. too. In general, um, usually the recommendation is seven years. Um, there are a lot of folks that, that keep things forever, but seven years really. And three years is the amount of time that um, the IRS could go back and maybe okay. audit your business tax return. So I'm kind of, I'm skipping around a little bit. I think, um, thanks for asking questions, because um, I know that very likely everyone has a, a very specific question about some of their accounting in their organization that um, we could do accounting 101 here, but that would take an entire semester, so we don't have <laughs> Where, what else do we want to talk about? Keeping good records. So a very, very hot topic, a very important question that comes up all the time is the, the difference between pay, paying someone as a contractor and bringing someone on board as an employee. Now, it's really, the first thing that I want to mention is it's, it's the law and it's the IRS that decides really, not us. But we still actually do have a lot of leeway, especially at the very beginning. If most of us aren't in a position where we need to hire a full-time staff or, or even a full-time employee uh, right away. And the way the IRS looks at which category someone might fall into is, um, and I'll use myself as an example, I do work for several companies in the area. But because I have more than one client, I've chosen to still be independent. I have my own independent business. And so then I fall under the independent contractor side here. Um, it's a little bit, um, a little bit of a question sometimes when I've got a very set schedule and I'm always at the same place at the same time and I'll be another place at the same time. One of the things the IRS does look for is do you have a set schedule as if you're an employee? Um, but but I am in charge of when I'm working, um, yeah, where I'm working and that kind of a thing, as opposed to an employee where if I were to say, I need some help and I need someone to work from nine o'clock until three o'clock every day and I need you to be in my office, you know, three of those days a week, very likely that is going to fall into more of an employee situation in and in that case then as the employer 
we um, pay payroll taxes, we withhold payroll taxes. Um, and then it just falls into a whole nother, another rule there. One, one um, topic that has come up with one of the companies that I worked with is um, with respect to an employee and overtime rules. I would like to bring this up because the Department of Labor is involved in that as well as the IRS. And the, under the law, if your employee works more than 40 hours a week, you have to pay them time and a half. And there, there's someone that I've been working with who was very well intentioned who had, excuse me, had their employees banking hours to take them off later and later. And even though the employee agreed to it, that still they still really were supposed to be paying time and a half for that time. And um, the reason that, that I get very concerned when, when I see someone unintentionally sometimes or unintentionally asking folks to bank hours is the, the Department of Labor um, has very onerous penalties if maybe you just have one employee who is disgruntled for some reason that one person can report you to the Department of Labor and then there will be back wages, penalties, interest, um, and if it's intentional and egregious and really bad, potential jail time for the employer. So it's that one is really ugly. Yeah, it's really ugly. So I, I encourage you not, not to ask people to bank hours if you're there in an employee situation. Um, is this something anyone wants to talk to? Because this, this comes up pretty frequently. Uh, I have a payroll question that has nothing to do with sure. being over. Um, <clears throat> but uh, well, one of the so I'm actually moving over to a different payroll person. I, my CPA um, started doing my payroll with Coda Pay, which sucks and mm -hmm. it's just had so many problems. Uh, but one thing I've had a really tough time doing is like registering with the EFT as peer. I can't remember mm -hmm. the acronym. Mm -hmm. But like I tried to register almost a year ago now because it's been almost a year I've been paying and um, and they kept saying oh yeah your password and username is in the mail and like I never got it oh. and I kept calling and then I get disconnected and I and I'm like so now I'm going through it again as I'm like transitioning to a different person but I'm like why so I, I what I don't understand is why the government makes it so difficult to pay them money like and now I'm scared because you 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 mentioned that story of penalties mm -hmm. and stuff and I'm like I'm so scared to get penalized like yes. I, I'm happy like I'm I'm switching to someone who knows his stuff on payroll and I wonder if you have cautionary tale like like maybe keep your payroll person and your CPA person separated because I feel like yikes I wish I had well pay one thing that I found is, and I actually use a payroll service myself because I'm I'm so like. Um, Respectful. I was going to say intimidated, but I'm so respectful of the complexity of payroll and how important it is to get to get your payroll taxes paid on a timely basis, um, and all of the other stuff that goes along with it. There's a, a lot. There's so much law or involved in payroll that's not even so just you've payroll not taxes. Even ever other touched stuff. How to register for all those different no, things? No, no. Yeah. Registering for sales tax? No. Yeah. So I've registered for sales tax in, in how about many 40 different states? states? But yeah, 40 states? yeah. There, are so trying, Delaware, New Hampshire, Oregon, I think. How long does that take like you to state? Uh, and about how much money? Well, so first of all, everyone is different, of course. Yeah. <laughs> they, some of them are starting to um, um, maybe like use the same software. It looks like their software looks familiar. But for some of the states, you can do it instantaneously. And for other states, you have to submit a form and it takes a little while and then they'll send you your, your sales tax registration and it is okay. yes it's ridiculous what about, <laughs> what about what about services or platforms that say that they handle that for you yes so what about QuickBooks that you link to your business account and it says that it processes payroll you know the implications of that that's yes that's not on your <laughs> well um so i do have several clients that use quickbooks payroll specifically right. and they haven't had any issues really? they've been very happy with do you have it. any clients who use wave no no mm -hmm. yeah so but um yeah um one of the companies that i worked with had their sales team spread out gosh i can't remember now but quite a number of different states so not only did we have 
sales tax. It was, it, I mean, it's a good thing if you have to register for sales tax in other states, that means you're doing business out there. So it's a, it's a good problem to have. But the sales tax registration is different than payroll registration if you have to submit payroll taxes for employees who might be in other states and um, doing all that, doing the registration in different states is, um, I kind of, I like to think of it as, the, all, this, all this various tax stuff I think of as like our franchise fee that we pay for the privilege of doing business in the best country in the world, but man, it's a pain, it's a pain. So I'm, I probably didn't answer your question. I haven't registered. Well, so I, so I do have something though that may be helpful. That if you you've retained record of your correspondence and trying to get this whole oh, registration process. No, yeah. So if someone comes back and says, "Well, we're going to ding you now because you no. haven't been paying," you can say, "Look, yeah. I have been trying." That's my plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it no. is usually it, it's usually. Um, um, Taxpayers are usually pretty successful in getting out of paying penalties and interest if, if you can demonstrate like I've been I've been trying to do it I'm supposed to do and I you know run into speed bumps for, for various reasons and then, um, it's usually yeah especially if you have, a genuinely, just a genuine reason for for having had it not work, then it's easy to get out of, to have someone yeah get you out of paying your penalties and interest. So what else are we looking at? Um, so with respect to contractors and employees, we have a date that is actually coming up now that we're in December. We're looking at um, January, it's right around the corner. If you do bring on someone to work with you as a contractor, you will need to issue a 1099 by January 31. Um, if you, for everyone that you paid more than, do I have my, for anyone who paid more than, I should say more than $600, during the year, I guess I can't get at this right now. So if you paid someone less than $600, you won't have anything that you'll need to file, but if it's more than 600, I use a tool that's called eFile Magic. Sounds very, <laughs> very respectable, eFile Magic. But I've been able to file um, 1099s for interest that we've paid for rent, for legal fees, um, you name it. It's, it's very easy and there's a small fee, but um, it was very easy to, to kind of navigate through that one. And if you hire employees, very likely you are using a payroll software or a payroll provider. And you know, we're all familiar with W-2s that need to be issued. So um, something to keep on your calendar if you want to get those filed. Preparing for tax time. Um, not a very humorous quote, but you know, we say all the time, nothing is certain but death and taxes. And I just learned today that I had been attributing the, that quote to Benjamin Franklin, but he was actually quoting uh, Daniel Defoe in, oh shoot, now I can't remember the name of his book from it's 1760 something uh, book that Daniel Defoe had written. And, and actually I welcome you all to ask any questions about filing taxes because we all fall some really somewhere in a very broad spectrum of having our paper records literally in a box all the way through having very professionally organized um, accounting software where your tax preparer just syncs right to it, lifts all the information out that they need and then e-files your business tax return. So um, if, if there's any, any question that anyone might have right now, please just throw it out. The, um, you, you may also be familiar with TurboTax. Is anyone thinking about filing their own business tax return through TurboTax. Again, yes. And so I've done that. This, this past year, we um, went to a CPA firm to do our tax return for one of our companies. But in the prior year, I had done it, uh, done it myself through TurboTax. And it's definitely a cost-effective way, especially if you just, you're like, I just need to get this filed. I feel like it's pretty good. It doesn't have to be flawless to get filed. Um, and um, we, I also found too, in a couple of the early tax returns that I had prepared for a, for a company, when we got larger and the, the tax needs were more complex, we needed to we wanted to do file for some research and development tax credits and some other things that were definitely outside my realm of expertise. The 
the CPA firm came back and looked at the prior returns that, that we had done and said, do you mind if, can we go ahead and, and amend these because we'd like to change some things so that it flows into what we want to do now. It's very common to have a tax return amended and sure you pay someone to do that, but then they know they're looking into the future to, to know how to help manage your um, tax situation. And then when we get pat, get it, when you start moving into a place where you really do want to have a professional uh, tax preparer do your business tax return, they will provide you with a list of, you know, um, they'll, depending on this, depending on a lot of things, but sometimes they'll even ask for bank reconciliations, um, credit card statements, items that you've purchased, um, computers, for example. Um, and they've got a big long list of things that would that they see as being relevant to your type of company and the industry that you're in. Um, and, but if you've if you've grown evolved to a place where you might have a more maybe you have someone on your team who is doing some of the bookkeeping for you in tax software, then um, then it becomes a little bit easier for the CPA to do it. It feels. It feels intimidating and scary sometimes to file your tax returns, but the professionals really know what they're doing. And, and one thing that I wanted to mention, because this has come up more than once in my career too, is the first time someone, um, or business owners or business partners, get to a point where maybe there's too much business volume, or they just realize, you know, I really don't like doing this, we need to hire someone else. When you start thinking about bringing in someone from the outside to help with your the financial transactions of your business, it's a very personal thing. It's very normal to feel that way because it is. And um, so I wanted to mention that with respect to the CPA profession, CPAs are licensed, like attorneys are licensed, doctors are licensed, and we have to comply with a code of professional conduct which includes confidentiality with respect to client matters so if you ever have a concern that you know I, I just I, I don't want my financial information regarding my business is private and I I really don't want to take this someplace else um, going to a CPA is hopefully will assuage that concern a little bit because they you're bound by a pro the code of professional conduct to maintain confidentiality with respect to anything that you may talk about with regard to your business. Tools, tools for the job. We talked about some things a little bit, but yep, so show of hands, uh, what, what tools are any of you using right now? QuickBooks is very common. Wave. Waves. QuickBooks. We're using, I have um, um, a couple of folks that are using QuickBooks right now, and one of whom is doing 25 million in revenue. So QuickBooks really can handle quite a volume of a business activity before you, you, but sometimes you don't have to change at all. I have another where we're in the process of implementing NetSuite, which is kind of on the other end of the spectrum as far as magnitude um, for much larger organizations, which, where they're hoping to go. We're not there yet, but they're hoping to go. But um, one thing that I do find is that the the software tools might differ slightly, but for the most part, they do work the same. So if you're um, considering changing from something that you're using now to something else, it won't be, um, they shouldn't be very difficult to work with. Um, and there are a lot of folks around that are, would be ha happy to help set something up. So if, you, if you're not interested, if you, you don't feel like you need to hire someone to keep your records for you, you can have someone come in and just help periodically maybe to get your software set up and sit with you and work a little while to say, um, you know, here are the, here's the normal pattern of transactions that you have, here's how we would record this kind, and here's how we would record that, and to give you a little bit of training so that you don't have to muddle through everything all by yourself. There's one, are some of you familiar with a, a tool called Bill.com? Have you ever used that? How, um, Melio is another one that I have here. 
Emilio is an app, and it's it's similar to Build.com that we connected for one of our clients where they do they've got a it's a very service oriented business. They've got lots of business and and um, residential customers in the area, and so they're constantly sending out like for lawn service is one of the things that they do, and so they are able to. Um, bill electronically, which a lot of you probably do send out an invoice electronically rather than on paper. Their customers can pay electronically and it comes right into, not only right into their bank account, but also into their QuickBooks software. And with Melio, we can also pay paper invoices that may come, a paper bills, like um, if we, um, let's say we purchase a new, um, lawnmower, you know, those, one of those great big ones, you know, then um, they go to Westenbrook Mower, purchase their lawnmower, they will email an invoice, and then uh, when we log into QuickBooks, we can open up that invoice and then just pay it electronically right out of QuickBooks. So, and it was very, it was really quite easy to set up, so I highly recommend checking this out um, if you would like to be able to pay electronically. Um, and that actually reminds me of something else that I'd like to chat about a little bit. And there's very, very um, rightly a great concern for security these days. We hear a lot about, a lot about fraud. And you may be interested to know that stealing paper checks is still the number one for the form of bank fraud that's happening. It happens everywhere, but it's happening. We, we got notice from our bank that they're seeing activity happening in Holland and the West Michigan area, stealing checks out of mailboxes, copying it, and then trying to you know spend some money. Believe it or not, electronic bill pay is far more secure than writing paper checks, which you would never guess by what you hear in the news. But the electronic bill payment is also really up to their game too. Um, for example, bill.com, that I don't know listed up here, when they pay, um, um, so we can, let's say we have an invoice we need to pay somebody, we'll click pay, and maybe it's someone who does, chooses not to ha have electronically received that payment. So bill.com will issue a check, and none of our bank's information shows up on that paper check at all. It's just references to bill.com. So then they, the, the bill pay companies, I mean, this they want to stay in business, right? They don't want to have any kind of fraudulent activity or any breaches happen. So they are really um, stepping up their game to protect their customers because that protects their, you know, the long term uh, of their that, business. I have a question about sure. how are people um, make, uh, making money off of paper checks? Like, just pretending to be whoever you're writing the check to? Yes, yeah, well, so let's say you get a check and it has my company name and my bank account number and so on on it. They um, would write a check maybe to themselves or... Okay, but they need a blank one. If you send yeah. a check that's written to a mm -hmm. specific entity in the mail... Yes. And I'm just, just thinking, because like, I've, yes. I've, I've, I've this past week just written a few checks where you, and you know those envelopes with the window in mm -hmm. it, and I turn it the other way, but you could probably visibly, if you're a USPS worker, see so you know there's a check, check in there. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. like, so is it, they couldn't do anything with that kind of check that's already... No, they would clean it up, you know, try to remove oh. information that's on there, or, or maybe, they, maybe they'll copy it and just lift just the data that they need to be able to create a, like a, a simile of a check. And we, and um, so I was working with a company like maybe, maybe as recently as a half a year ago where they pretended, um, well there's so those who, another company out there that were pretending that they needed to hire someone to facilitate inter, international bill payments. They said, we are located in the Netherlands we have a customer in California uh, who does a lot of business in Michigan. We would like, could we hire someone to facilitate collecting the invoices, getting the payment, remitting it back? And as we started doing our due diligence, I was talking to our bank, like down the street and around the corner from us right now, and um, as a check came through, they said, my customer, customer was kind of annoyed because they said, well, we, we why is it going to take them 10 days to clear this check? You, you know, we've been paid, we need to receive the money. And they said, just, you know, time out, let's just let it work its process. As it turns out, the, um, 
it was completely fraudulent that the person who had the, had sent this check to my customer had um, somehow gotten a hold of bank information from uh, somebody else somewhere and written a fraudulent check was what they wanted to have happen was have it, uh, the money pass all the way through the system so then I don't remember how the whole step-by-step -step thing was happening but um, so I got caught an international check scheme was got caught by one of the banks right here in Holland and it was like like seventy thousand dollars it was it was a big thing um, can you if, if you use a um, tri-color printed check with holographic images if you can't distort it's the same process that the government uses to print our money they print it on crane and company paper and then they use that where you lift it and you see the things those are harder they're harder to distort and mm -hmm. to electronically tamper with because they it will create damages to the paper. Yes. So yes. you could order those kind of mm -hmm. checks too. Uh, most mm -hmm. banks have them, and the seal, mm -hmm. if it's broken or if the if you do anything to it, it's really sensitive mm -hmm. paper. And you're going to yes. see it. Yes. That's yes, and yes. So check printing companies are also upping their game to try to protect customers from you know, being the subject of some kind of fraudulent activity. So, um, so the moral of the story is, if you don't have like Temple Santessa paper checks, <laughs> um, can, do consider paying all bills electronically. In fact, so I was, I was um, chatting with another one of our surge members recently, and she's just starting um, walking into her business building process. And it's, it, it feels like it's too early to even start saying, I'm gonna set up an accounting system and do all these things. She's not going to have very many transactions. So what we, what we talked about doing just for the very beginning is using her online banking bill pay function. If you, if you haven't looked, you probably are all familiar with that. But you create your, you are in charge of creating your vendor in your bill pay function in, in your online banking system then you can push a, a check out to your um, to your vendor straight out of your bank. And the bonus was when you get your bank statement, it says exactly, and rather than just saying there's some check that cleared, it says exactly oh. who it was paid to. Wait it's, a minute. It's so a it's super like easy way. Check, but even because I have vendors that will only accept check. Mm -hmm. So, but this is not a wire transfer. Correct. You Would can do it as a paper check. You can do it as a paper check. Probably. Mm -hmm. So you refer. So this is a bill pay function, and mm -hmm. you can send a check electronically, basically. Yes, you can do it as paper, or you can do it electronically. And yeah, this one of the things that I do love about it is in, when I get my bank statement, or you, when you see your bank statement, it's it's very very clear who you wrote it to. So it's almost as if you don't, have, especially for the young lady that we were talking to here. I, you know, um, from the amount of transactions she expected to have, she doesn't even need to set up any accounting system because every single thing is right there on her bank statement with enough clarity that she can just look at it and she knows exactly what it is. Keep in mind though, if you opt for a paper check to be sent, it, it can take up to a couple of weeks before they get it. So mm -hmm. we had a little bit of an issue with what our expectations were because we had to get that. I, that there have been and times the size. I've had to overnight it because I, I have like mm -hmm. no other option if I'm working with a textile mill that's like 100 years old they only mm -hmm. is that or a wire mm -hmm. transfer and the wire transfer is just as expensive as overnighting a check mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so another thing to keep in mind too is and this is with paper checks or electronic that payments over ten thousand dollars go through an extra level of vetting in the banking process regardless because of um, one of the reasons is um, international money laundering rules that went into place after 9-11, but, um, but now it's even more so because this the added aspect of um, fraud due diligence too on top of it. So the larger that check is, especially if it's over 10,000, it's um, the likelihood of being able to pay nearly instantaneously or within a couple of days. For that very first check, it's gonna take longer than once the recipient has been vetted through the banking system, then it's usually a little bit easier. But so there's still, yeah, there's still things there that slow it down. But, but um, I highly recommend, yeah. 
when to hire someone. When to hire someone? Well, um, that's a great question. First of all, if, if you ha don't have the cash, then that uh, kind of answers your question. That's a very, very, very normal thing that people ask and answer. But where I've seen it start to happen is when, um, first of all, if you're it's like, this is not my gig, I really don't want to do it. I want it, do want to have it done right. I'm going to hire somebody else to do it. It's it's a okay to say I just don't want I just don't want to have to do this. Um, if you don't have time, this happens a lot when things start getting going. The transaction activity starts to increase, and you're working on the stuff that's fun. You started you didn't start your unless you're like me, you didn't start your business to do accounting and finance and prepare uh, financial reports. Uh, bring in somebody else and there are great do, do any of you use uh, a remote bookkeeping service or maybe someone outside of your own team who does work for you and then maybe sends it back it's um, it's really the super hot thing in the CPA firm world right now is to have teams in the firm who will really do bookkeeping for folks because there's so such um, such a greater um, electronic facilities for everything um, from bookkeeping the technology is just um, partially because of COVID the technology today is so much more advanced than what it had been and of course we also have zoom so rather than sitting down in person and you know and talking through bookkeeping types of stuff you hop on a meeting with someone they talk through what was this invoice for what did you do and how should we record it and did you get your bank statement yet uh, it's there's a lot of opportunity to hire someone on an as-needed basis in that capacity. And then an added benefit is if, um, if you're working with maybe a bookkeeper who's at a CPA firm, you know that your, your records are going to be right in order just the way you're going to need it for your tax return when the time okay, comes. Okay, so I could go to a CPA who's, who has their own firm and say, okay, like what's the extra cost mm -hmm. for a bookkeeper? Yes. And then, and then kind of look at that cost and decide, well, is it cheaper just to hire someone and train them? Yes. And then uh, on, like, I, the next question for me after this is, when do I hire a controller? And what is the difference? Excellent. That's a fantastic question. So um, as we talked about, bookkeeping is getting all those transactions recorded and make sure you're capturing all the, everything that's happening. What the controller does is takes a step back to say, are the um, bank reconciliations being done? Are these transactions being recorded in the proper way? When I take a look at the, re the report of all the activity, or, and this is, this is almost always a CPA, though not necessarily, um, is everything really categorized as it should be in the proper buckets? If we paid rent, has it been recorded as rent, or did it accidentally get recorded as you know, office supplies or something? The controller controls the um, completeness and accuracy of the bookkeeping records, but also um, things like um, is everybody getting their expense reports turned in? You know, are we following proper protocol and stuff? The controller is kind of a, a CYA for the business um, in protecting the business assets and minimizing risk, like from a financial perspective, keeping their eyes open for, do we have an appropriate amount of insurance coverage? And expanding on that, that role of keeping, uh, um, keeping all the records, keeping all the transactions recorded, and then stepping out to, to um, having a bigger picture on the whole financial aspect of what, that business. In your experience, what revenue, what gross revenue our company is, uh, did, would a company need to reach for that to make sense? Oh gosh, it's more of a transaction volume, really. Okay. Yeah, I know, and I know I sound like I'm punting, but and so there are other factors too that could impact it. If someone is looking for um, outside investors or bank financing, not so. Yeah, if you're looking for outside investors, you might really want to have a part-time controller to make sure that um, people are going to want to see financial statements. Our financial statements 
presented in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Um, but a controller is also something that you can hire on a part-time basis. And would, could I get access to one through a good CPA firm? Yes. Or is that, mm -hmm. yeah, ta yeah, my tax preparation bill is huge. I, so, um, I was about to tell you a story about someone close to me and I can't because some of you might know him. <laughs> and someone very near and dear to me um, came to me a couple of years ago and said, I cannot believe how much I just paid my CPA to do our tax returns this year. He said yeah, it would be a lot cheaper if I would hire someone to do my accounting. And I said, that's probably right. <laughs> um, some things have fallen off the rails as staff turnover in, inside this person's business. And um, so we work together to clean up some things and find someone to come in and, and keep the records a little more in order. Mm. Well, one of the things that I wanted to include is a, an illustration of what the output of your financial transaction record keeping will look like. One of the reports that, if you're not familiar with, you will become very familiar with, is your balance sheet. And a, your balance sheet is a record of what do we own and what do we owe. For example, you've got on this side, on this side, we've got cash, accounts receivable is what other people owe us for goods we've sold or services that we've sold. We own, we, um, we own our inventory, maybe there's some other stuff. We own our building, usually not recommended inside your company, but that's a whole different story. Um, we own some equipment. So these are all the things that this company actually owns. On this side will show, here's what we owe to other people. We've got some bills we have to pay. Um, maybe we, we've got some money that we owe, owe to our bank. And then what we have left over is our net worth, which is kind of intuitively makes sense um, when you think about um, your home too. If you own your house and maybe the market value is maybe 300,000, but you have a mortgage of 150, your homeowner's equity would be the difference between the two. And that's exactly the same concept. What we own minus what we owe is the net worth of the business. And so this helps, this, this you can look at a snapshot in time at any time. I know how much cash I have. I know how much, how many bills I owe. I know what I owe to the bank. And I know what I have left over. And you know what you owe to the government? Or Probably, yeah. well, yeah. That, so that's a, you know, it's a calculation that someone, well, it depends what, what tax it is, but usually in here, like, if you have payroll taxes that you need to remit, then your payroll taxes will be sitting here, and um, for the companies that I work with, we, we've elected to be taxed as a C corporation, so I, we do keep a running balance kind of of what what that um, like accrued income tax liability will be. That's an excellent question because it isn't something that always shows up, especially if you have a, a pass-through business, if you have an LLC or an S corporation, and then those, because the company itself doesn't. So I know it's, that's a, it's a, definitely a tax question, but. Um, well, okay, can I just ask the relationship yeah, between do. you and your, and your clients, when they do business with you, are you updated every month on their financials? And then do you take time to review it and say, oh, wow, you invested a lot in equipment this month. You know, we need to, uh, if we're gonna depreciate this over time, we need to spin, spin, spin before the end of the year. Um, you know, are you- For tax planning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so are you going to, so is that is that part of your relationship or is that more a relationship with, uh, someone else in control that's a great question well so it could be either it's depending on who you know if you have someone on your team and, and that's something that you really want to watch for or and it, I would say it's a matter of if you ask someone to help you with that they will mm -hmm. but to do tax planning toward the end of the year right um, there are two clients I'm working with right now that are more focused on what do I how do I build you know I want I need to get ready for new business coming in or, or looking into the future 
So suspending questions is our first suspending question is, is this something that I need to effectuate my business plan? And then we talk about timing. Do we spend it in December or do we spend it in January um, if we have the money to because it could impact our tax situation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so right now the companies that are really growing um, have such a tax loss carry forward that it doesn't matter. They have such a what? Tax, a tax loss carry forward oh. that we're, yeah, we're carrying our, our, our early stage losses forward into the future. So, so that they're early, doesn't matter. you're yeah. working with startups. Yes, then. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except for another one where um, uh, we kind of just went through the exercise of saying, well, what does it look like your taxable income might shake out to be this year. And if you have something that you want to buy, do you want to buy it in December? Or, you know, not depending on cash or financing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you working through that process yourself right now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Never ending, yes. Always want to optimize the tax law to reduce your tax bill in that tax, um, tax planning is not tax. There's a difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion. Tax evasion is not legal, but tax avoidance is highly recommended. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yeah. Would, that be, would that mean that you would need um, um, a tax attorney? Because oftentimes CPA will tell you, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know how I can do that. So wouldn't you that, have to have a legal counsel question too? That's a great question because it might depend on the question you're asking. The CPAs, that the tax accountants, the, the CPAs who specialize in tax work um, are, are um, C, they're accountants, and so they'll do a lot of forward-looking tax planning, just like Liz was talking about. So you may have been, yeah, you may have had something else that you were working with where you might have needed tax counsel. Like to engage in tax avoidance. Could your average CPA do that that is not trained yes. in tax preparation? If they're not trained in tax prep, no, no. Right. You definitely want someone who's a tax tax accountant. So this is what our balance sheet looks like, and then this is what our income statement will look like. So again, after we've done all of our bookkeeping and all of our record keeping and everything is properly recorded in our system, then your accountant. Um, controller in some cases, will be able to run operating reports for you so that you can see um, the output, what your, what all your transactions and all your business activity, how does it translate into um, what we call the bottom line. Your sales number is always at the top. Um, for, yeah, Liz and Temple and for those of you who, are, who have product that you're selling to people, you know, you have to purchase items to be able to create your product and that'll be your cost of goods sold which helps you calculate a gross profit off the items that you sold then you've got your expenses we, we want to pay our people we need to pay, pay for our space we um, are depreciating our equipment and then when we get to this point this we can say based on our normal business operations this is the profit that we've made for this particular time period and then, um, you know, maybe you have some interest expense, maybe you have some debt, maybe some other bad things happen. And then this is what we refer to as our bottom line. So one thing I don't see in here, um, prompted by your question, Liz, I don't see any um, allowance for income taxes. Mm -hmm. And that... So it's the EBIT or... This, um, so if we, if we, so this is net income. So and Liz is asking about something called EBITDA, which is a very, earnings before interest taxes, depreciation and amortization, which is a very common benchmark um, that people like to refer to um, as a proxy for cash flow. What's our actual cash flow? So we would have earnings and we would add back interest. We would add back depreciation. Taxes is an odd one. But so then there would be another line down here as just sort of an auxiliary piece of information. This is my EBITDA calculation. Earnings plus interest plus depreciation. That's a great question. We should, I should be writing these questions down for like a follow-up session. <laughs> okay. 
So are there any other questions that come to mind? I know that this is a very high level um, overview type discussion and we've asked some really great, great questions already and we haven't really done like a bookkeeping 101 type of um, session, but we could do that in the future. One thing that I feel is always holding me back, uh, well, or will hold me back once I have capacity for it, I, I want to grow internationally, but I've looked into working with warehouses, and if I go that route, you know, it's obviously like I'll get to make more money um, uh, than if I were wholesaling and selling things half off, but there's so much that and paperwork and hoops to jump through that I kind of feel like, oh my God, is that worth it? Like I need an employee, one employee just to manage all that. And I wonder, have you helped a client grow internationally in that way? And like, what did, like, was it worth it? Kind of like that, Liz, yeah. are you trying to manufacture out of the country? Or no, I'm talking them? about just ship product to a warehouse and then people and buy it on my website, but it gets so. shipped out of a warehouse. Interna abroad, because oh, I I currently ship internationally uh, from Holland, um, but I'm shipping. I actually, you know, I lost probably ten grand this past year shipping USPS and having the packages come back to me, and so I've switched to UPS and people pay a lot of money and I'm trying to figure out a way to like kind of split the difference, but there's like no way to do that right now with international shipping. On the Shopify, Shopify is actually building an app for me to do that like to do so, fulfillment no for it just to offer like a 50 percent like swaggle me will take 50 percent of no. your shipping costs there's like no way to do that but ultimately you want to like let's say that you ship product to china you have some big market in china yeah. you want to ship it there and you want the fulfillment and send yeah. it in china to ship it in china so yeah. you don't deal with the zip code yeah. and stuff and, and and that's expensive because they charge you for when it comes they charge you for uh, the pick fee, the storage fee, the, uh, you know, so they, there's a lot of fees, but then they also charge you all this tax. And the, the, and when I first looked into it for Australia, it would be my number one market. And it was just so complicated, I, I gave up. Mm -hmm. And there may also be, well, speaking from state to state to state in the United States, if you have physical product located in a state, then it triggers a whole different kind of like income tax filing too, if you were to have, which is, a, yes. That's why, we, that's why we've got state and local tax experts that specialize just in state and local tax inside our CPA firm, CPA firm that, with which I used to work. And, but there are also international, international people. It'd be worth buying a, an hour or two with an international tax person. Mm -hmm. Liz, are you are you doing your shipment by air? Uh, and what's your delivery time? Do they get it really expediently? Now, yes, UPS, yeah. Mm -hmm. UPS is getting it. Have you ever ordered there. something, um, and then they're, they're not from America, but you find that out later, like you bought something yes. on Facebook, mm -hmm. and then it takes you like a month to get your thing? You yeah. get it, but it just takes a really long time because you have no idea when you're checking out that's gonna happen. It's yeah. because they ship by sea. It's a lot cheaper. It's 60% yeah. cheaper if you ship by air. That's what I used to do. But, but it it's, no, it, it's not just that. It doesn't get there. It doesn't get there. So then that's why I lost money. So I was shipping things that the addresses would even valid, verify in the system, but it would never get there. It would get returned to me, and then I'm out. 16 20 bucks yeah. it's still 16 to 20 bucks to ship to abu dhabi and if it comes back to me i'm out i'm up not only that 16 20 dollars but that sale mm -hmm. that i probably invested time and yeah. money and then of course the product and like all of that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then so and then of course i had there's a transaction fee that i'm hit with too right. when i do the refund so it's just like it's it's such a loss and i've, I've filled out forms of that there's the post office does this awful thing where like especially with COVID, there were some countries that were off and on, off and on, and they wouldn't communicate to me, they wouldn't communicate with any of the apps, no stamps.com, no ship station, and so I just get all these packages back to me and have to learn the hard way that, oh, we can't ship to that country anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's just been awful. So so there's people yes. like an international tech. Who specialize, yes. Yep. Uh, so I have a, a couple questions about uh, expense reports. Yes. Um, about 20% of our bill material costs for ordering tags is 
miscellaneous bits and pieces, a lot of which were borrowed from Amazon, you know, just screen folds, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And uh, historically, it's been one of us that just paid for it with our personal credit card, and then we expense the company mm -hmm. on an expense report. But what, what are the rules, you know, a lot of, especially Amazon transactions, right? You don't get a receipt right. necessarily. I usually just print, you know. Yes. And so what's required versus, you know, is there a version of the receipt that should actually be stapled to an expense report? And if it's under 100 bucks. Yes. Well, oh, yes. Yeah. So there are, two, there are like two different aspects. One is for your record keeping for your company where you actually want to know right. what did it cost us to build this yes. thing. Yeah. Um, and on the other hand, what do you need to document so that it's deductible for taxes? And yeah, Liz, can you look that up? Yeah, sure. Okay, <laughs> look up the, there is a threshold under which you don't need to have a receipt to, um, for filing your tax return and for those little like, bits and pieces. You know, we order 50 things at once and it's yes. well, $1,000, but they're all $5 items. You know, it's I like, thought yes. it would have increased. You know, uh, the no, actually, in 2018, it says $75, but oh. I could have sworn, I mean, with everything, it should have increased yes. here by now. Mm -hmm. hey, but, so yeah, that's a good, so actually that's higher than I would have got for, yeah, 75 bucks. You are able to get invoices off Amazon mm -hmm. um, on the desktop version, because mm -hmm. we order Amazon a lot um, through Lakeshore Advantage. Right. If you well, looked into that. Yeah, I mean, I, I print them. The mm -hmm. issue is, you know, is when you order something, which is what is coming out, you know, print the receipt, yeah. get the receipt out. You know, a lot of times because they're good shipping, it's not shipped yet. Right. You know, it's like, so that could be a so, fraud opportunity because you can return or cancel true. later. Oh, and, you know, that's true. That's, yeah. So, what's well, actually needed? so that's actually another, that's a good point for having, that's some a job that a controller would do is that they're controlling the, um, What's a good word? The um, credibility of the transaction that's going through. Mm -hmm. And so you would recommend to print the receipt after it's been delivered, you know, mm -hmm. so because that shows when it's been delivered, um, shipping costs, then it's fully loaded, so to speak. And what, what actually brings something else to mind, if you're not familiar with this, you can have an Amazon business account, then everyone can use the same account and then someone else, your bookkeeper, whomever, someday when you have a bookkeeper, can go and you, then you don't have to print that, they can just go grab all those receipts. And, and I, my understanding is that um, there is, a, it's like an Amazon Prime type fee, but I think occasionally there are also discounts that if you have a business account, then there are, it's better pricing on some things too. One other question. Sure. You know, we're, so we're a C unpaid mm -hmm. employees, I guess. Um, I keep hearing rumors occasionally that it is illegal not to pay anyone who do work for the company, including the founders from an accounting point of view. You know, I have, yeah, I was thinking of the S Corp. Um, so someone else brought that up to me within the past week, so that's on my, top of my to-do list to figure that out because it's, so common that it, I would say it's normal for an early stage business for the founders to choose to go without being paid for some extended period of time. It's just a practical reality of what the way it is. So, um, it. So one thing that you, um, yeah, I better not say anything more before I go check it out because you know it's a matter of the tax law. But there is um, a lot of. Um, focus on, especially in an S corporation, which it would be your C corporation, but making sure that there's a fair fair market wage for the owner because of difference in tax rates, whether you're getting paid as an employee or if it's for managing your tax, your overall big picture tax liability. Yeah, that's an important thing, but um, I'm going to check into that, um, so I'm glad you asked. That's come up in another situation as well. Okay, and one last thing. Um, because of that scenario, should we, things like mileage, and then it gets really complicated when we bring in all our office equipment, you know, right. computers, or personal devices that right. are owned by us. Is there any general recommendation when it comes to that stuff in that scenario? Or no, I think that, that your general, um, 
rules of thumb, like just keeping track of your records and ex submitting an expense report, you'd be, you might be surprised at how frequently a formal expense report isn't something that even gets submitted. You know, someone might say, here's a receipt, can you reimburse me for this? And having a piece of paper that says expense report and a date and a name and everything itemized and the receipts attached, um, even that just goes a long way. And even if it's even if it's just demonstrating you're actually trying to do things in a proper fashion, that goes a long way too.